Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started very shortly. Thank you very much for attending. My name is Chris Nicholson. I'm Director of Philanthropy at Gladstone Institutes. Today, as part of the Newton series, we're going to focus on the epilepsy research, which one of our investigators, Jean Paz, is doing at her lab at Gladstone. The series name came from the notion that Isaac Newton, when he was quarantined during the plague, <clears throat> did some uh, significant research that led to amazing groundbreaking discoveries. And so during this time of quarantine in, in, in um, the world right now, our investigators are hard at work doing non-COVID related research. We felt it was really important to not only via webinars discuss the COVID-19 research that Gladstone investigators are doing, but also shine a light on some of the great work that's taking place in the other institutes at, at Gladstone. Today, the format will be as follows. Jean Paz will present her work. She'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes talking with you about the epilepsy research that she's been doing at Gladstone for the past five years. Then uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have two special guests with us today, David Parker and Hillary Winton. They're parents who have a child who has epilepsy and they met with Jean Paz and I in October of this past year to learn more about her research and to share their experiences as parents uh, who have a child who has epilepsy. And then at around 1240, we'll transition to Q&A where you the participants have the opportunity to ask questions to Jean Paz or to David or to Hillary. And to do that, you need to use the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. Everyone who is attending the webinar is, is muted. So don't worry if there's noise in the background. Uh, we're not going to hear it. Um, if you want to contribute to the discussion, you can use the Q&A box. And at around 1240, um, we'll have a dialogue with you. So before John presents, I'd like to say a little bit about her and the work that she's doing in her lab. She's an associate investigator at Gladstone Institute. She's also a professor of neurology in the Kavli Institute for Fundamental Neuroscience at UC San Francisco. Before she joined Gladstone, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University and she earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. In 2019, Jean Paz received the very prestigious Vilshik Prize. It's awarded annually to immigrants who have made lasting contributions to American society. Two prizes are awarded, one in biomedical science and one in a rotating category of arts and humanities. Currently, Jean Paz's lab aims to improve outcomes for patients with epilepsy by studying the disorder in animal models and identifying potential targets for new therapeutic interventions. A signature approach in her lab is optogenetics, which she's going to talk about in some detail. Optogenetics enables her team to disrupt, disrupt the function of specific brain cells in live animals. Using this approach, the group is identified in a small brain region called the thalamus as a choke point for various forms of epilepsy and a promising target for future therapies. I'd like now to welcome my colleague, Jean Paz, who will talk about her work at Gladstone. Thank you, Chris, for introducing me. Um, it's an honor to be here to give a talk today. Uh, so thank you for all of you who are listening. Before I start, can you see my slides? I'm sharing my slides. You can see them, right? Yes. yes. OK, thanks. So uh, I would like to start by thanking all the lab members uh, who have been really um, you know, important for contributing to the work we are doing. And the picture needs to be updated. We had many trainees. Um, who um, worked on epilepsy research in our lab. And I would like to thank all of them because the work we are doing would not be possible without our trainees. 
So what is epilepsy? As Chris said, my lab is focused on understanding which cells in the brain are responsible for seizures. So epilepsy is actually characterized by unprovoked recurrent seizures. And here on top, you can see an EEG recording during the seizure. You can see this electrical activity that transitions from a normal desynchronized background to this spiking to the that represents a seizure. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurological disorders. According to the uh, Epilepsy Foundation, um, one person in 26 will develop epilepsy during the course of their life. So it's very common. Epilepsy can result from a variety of causes. Uh, it can result from genetic mutations. Uh, it can be acquired, for example, after brain lesions like stroke or traumatic brain injuries. In my lab, we are interested in different types of epilepsies. So today I'm gonna to start by talking what kind of work we are doing in acquired epilepsies. Um, this includes both post-stroke epilepsy and post-traumatic epilepsy. And then I'm gonna end with um, a recent work done in the lab on genetic childhood genetic epilepsies. So in acquired epilepsies, as I said, that result, for example, from brain lesions like stroke or trauma, um, we are trying to understand which cells and which neural circuits are responsible for the development of epilepsy. What we know is that human patients after stroke or traumatic brain injuries can develop epilepsy over time. Sometimes it takes months, it can also take years, and despite beautiful work in the field for decades that described in detail the various changes that are going on in the brain between the lesion and the development of epilepsy. We still don't fully understand what, what kind of changes in the brain are adaptive versus maladaptive. In other words, um, for example, some cells in the brain become hyperexcitable, meaning hyper-responsive to the um, for example, a sensory stimulation from the outside world. However, we don't know if those changes are necessarily causing epilepsy or whether they are very important for the normal recovery of brain functions. And the lack of tools in the field um, in the past have slowed down this type of research, you know, to understand which cells, which types of activities, which brain regions are causally involved in the development of epilepsy versus uh, the normal recovery of brain functions. So nowadays we are very lucky to have uh, many tools that are used not just by my lab but many other labs in the field. One of those tools is called optogenetics. I'm going to introduce that um, in the next slides. And those tools allow us to understand um, the necessity or the sufficiency of certain cells to lead to a seizure. Those tools also allow us to investigate which cells are sufficient to target in the brain to stop seizures without side effects. So here you can see a trace of the seizure and the spectral features of the seizure. You can see this large spiking activity that represents neural synchronization in the brain during the seizure. And we know that brain lesions can lead to acute seizures. So that's not called epilepsy. Um, acute seizures, anyone can have them, but only certain people will develop epilepsy over time. So those are the questions that we're trying to investigate. Why do certain individuals develop epilepsy and others do not? So these are the tools that we're using in my lab to try to understand um, which cells are sufficient to target to stop seizures, which cells or circuits are sufficient to target to prevent the development of epilepsy. So we're trying to understand what changes in single, single neurons cause changes uh, in the local circuit activity. Local circuits are, are connections between neurons, local neurons. And in the thalamus, such local connections are known to be rhythmogenic, meaning they can initiate oscillations, abnormal oscillations that can also spread to the entire brain because the thalamus projects to the entire cerebral cortex. So it's a structure that's involved in generalizing seizures, spreading the seizure to the brain. 
We are using mainly optogenetic tools. These are tools that were developed by Carl Geiseroff and Ed Boyden at Stanford. Um, and these are tools that allow us to express ion channels, uh, for example, in specific neurons, uh, ion channels that are sensitive to light. And these channels allow us to increase the activity of uh, a particular neuron or decrease the activity of particular neuron with light. For example, in this case, you can see that blue light is used to increase the activity of a certain cell, whereas the yellow light is um, used to reduce the activity of a certain cell. And so these are the tools that we actually used to demonstrate for uh, the first time that in a rat model of post-stroke epilepsy, we could instantaneously abort um, generalized seizures by shining the light and inhibiting just a very small cell population in a structure called the thalamus. So the tools that we are using, as I said, to understand what cells, what circuits are involved in epilepsy uh, are electrophysiological tools. Um, this allows us to understand what changes in the electrical activity of neurons uh, is causative of seizures. We're also using imaging miniature microscopes that we can um, implant on top of the brain to visualize what happens with the neurovascular coupling, meaning the relationship between the talk between the vascular and the neuronal components during seizures. And we're using real-time optogenetics and pharmacology. What is real-time optogenetics? So we're trying to detect the seizures before they start. That's the dream, detect the seizures before they start by reading the EEG and try to find out which cells or which circuits can be targeted with light very briefly to prevent the development of the seizure. So um, the kind of work that we're currently doing for understanding acquired epilepsies um, are gonna be presented here on the slides. One of the projects I'm very excited about is this one. We're investigating the relationship between the neurovasculature and the seizures. So the approach we're using uh, is described here. So we are capturing simultaneously the electrical and vascular data. Uh, and the goal is to characterize how does the neurovascular coupling change over the course of a seizure? Can changes in vasculature predict seizure initiation or duration or termination? And then we're trying to manipulate uh, the neurovascular coupling. Um, the question we're asking is, can manipulating, for example, the vascular dynamics alter the seizure progression? Can manipulation of vascular remodeling after stroke, for example, uh, can it en enhance recovery after stroke and prevent seizures? So this is a beautiful image from a very talented postdoc in the lab, Andrew Chang, who is investigating these questions that I just presented on the previous slide. Here you can see an image of a brain from a mouse uh, and in green, you can see large vessels um, across the brain. In red, you can see uh, small vessels. And when there is an injury, here this is a traumatic brain injury, there is, um, there is a loss of certain vessels. But over time, the brain has an amazing ability to recover. And there will be vascular remodeling. And one of the questions we are asking is whether certain aspects of the vascular remodeling are responsible for the normal versus abnormal recovery of the brain. So here you will see a video of vascular dynamics. You can see the, the blood cells flowing, flowing through the um, arteries or veins. It looks like a highway seen from top. And we're investigating this before, during, and after seizures to try to understand uh, whether, as I said earlier, whether we can predict the seizures by looking at the vascular dynamics. There is a major vascular remodeling after brain injuries. Here, the top row shows that there is a disruption in large vessels, so you can see less green here um, in the mouse brain after a stroke. But three weeks later, you can see that the vasculature recovers. 
However, some aspects of this recovery, we believe, are underlying the development of epilepsy, the process that we call epileptogenesis. And entering the lab is investigating what aspects um, govern the appropriateness of the recovery after a stroke. So here I'm going to show you um, a finding that I, I think is very exciting. Um, Andrew found that arteries contract before the seizure starts. Um, again, this is a preliminary result. We haven't published this yet. And um, what Andrew showed is that here you can see the artery. It has this diameter, right, shown in red. But during the seizures, actually right before the seizures, this vasculature contracts here. The artery will contract. And here I'm going to show you a video so you can visualize the contraction. Um, in red, you, will, you see the blood dynamics. So when it goes down, it means the, um, um, so it's a proxy for the diameter. When the signal goes down, it means that the artery here in this region of interest is contracting. And here at the top, you can see the EEG, so the electrical signals that we are recording from the same brain region at the same time. So what you will notice here, you can see the cursor uh, that shows that there is a contraction. I'm going to play this movie again. But there is a contraction of this vessel before the seizure actually starts. So you can see the seizure starting here, uh, here. So you can see that this contraction happened before the seizure started. So we're currently investigating uh, whether uh, this contraction um, can be predictive of seizures, different types of seizures. Here, uh, I want to show you another video so you can visualize the electrical activities and the vascular diameter uh, at the same time and how tightly they're coupled. And here you can see the vessel at the same time. So each time there is a, an EEG spike here that represents an abnormal neuronal synchronization, meaning that a bunch of neurons are firing at the same time, there is a contraction in this artery. Here, this is the video I promised you to show twice. You will see that the diameter, for example, of this artery will be contracting um, actually before the seizure. And you can see how dramatic the contraction is. So, please note this diameter here and how strongly it's contracting. And so what we're trying to do with Andrew, as I said, is to understand whether this contraction and this change in the blood flow could actually be, um, could actually allow us to predict when, whether a seizure is going to occur or not, because in some cases, this contraction occurs minutes earlier. Um, so the goal of those slides was to give you a flavor of the kind of work we're doing. So just to summarize, uh, for acquired epilepsy, we're looking at how the blood vessels and the neurons rewire after brain injuries, um, stroke, and trauma. And we're trying to understand whether some aspects of the vascular dynamics can allow us to predict whether the individual will have a seizure or not. Um, now I'm going to move um, to the next slides um, that are related to genetic epilepsies. So as I said in my lab, we're also very interested in understanding how genetic, how uh, mutations in certain genes can lead to epilepsy. And I'm in particular interested in childhood uh, genetic epilepsies, such as the Dravet syndrome, as well as the lennox gasteau um, syndrome. Those are very severe epilepsies. Um, this is a, uh, a slide that introduces what the Dravet syndrome is. So it's a very severe childhood epilepsy. It's intractable, meaning that it's usually resistant to drug treatments, although there are some very promising treatments that came out recently for, um, for uh, treating the generalized tonic upon convulsive seizures. Um, this epilepsy can be associated with sudden unexpected death, uh, which we call SUDEP. And, um, Behavioral, behavioral abnormalities like autism. 
often the uh, Dravet syndrome is associated with autism, although it's not the case um, each time and for every patient. And it's a genetic epilepsy. Uh, so about 70% of patients have a mutation in a gene called SCN1A, which encodes for the NAV1.1 sodium channel. So to understand um, how the seizures occur in this brain and uh, whether the thalamus could be targeted to disrupt the seizures, we used um, a mouse model of Dravet syndrome, which was kindly provided to us by Katsuhiro Yamakawa. This mouse line has a, a mutation, in a, has a human genetic mutation. And you can see here that it develops epileptic seizures shown here in the EEG that are very similar to what we see in human patients. So um, children with Dravet syndrome can have a variety of types of seizures. And that's the difficulty here. They can have convulsive seizures, but also non-convulsive seizures. My lab is very interested in understanding the basis of non-convulsive seizures. Non-convulsive seizures are related or associated with a brief episode of loss of consciousness, but this can occur up to 200 times a day. And the mechanism of this, the occurrence of the seizures uh, have been less studied in general than those of the convulsive seizures. However, in my lab, we believe it's really important to study the seizures uh, because they could be in part um, responsible for the cognitive dysfunction um, in children with Dravet. So uh, here, the work we do in mice, we want to make sure it's relevant to um, human patients. So we start collaborating with uh, Maria Roberta Silio, who is a clinician and who, who treats uh, patients with Dravet syndrome. And she's the one who provided the EEG recordings from human patients that we were able to compare to EEG data from our mice. You can see the seizures, uh, the seizures are very similar in terms of their duration and in terms of uh, being associated with the loss of consciousness, which is something I'm not showing here. So um, Stephanie Mackinson, who's a very talented postdoc in my lab, who was, she, um, she moved on and got a job now, um, but she found actually that targeting the thalamus could be sufficient to disrupt this non-convulsive seizures in the mouse model of Dravet syndrome. So for this, she expressed the opsin called SSFO, but the name doesn't matter here. She expressed this opsin in the thalamus, which allowed us to change the activity of neurons in this brain area during a seizure. So here you can see the seizure of a normal Spiking. And when we shine the light in this area of the brain, in the thalamus, this is a very brief light pulse. See, it's uh, less than 50 milliseconds, actually. Well, that was sufficient to immediately stop the seizure. And the mouse recovered normal behavior. So this obviously does not tell us that the thalamus is responsible for seizures, but it tells us that the thalamus could be targeted to stop this non-convulsive seizures. And it also tells us that thalamic activity is probably necessary for maintaining the seizures. This is the same example of a seizure, just to show you uh, the normal EG activity, the seizure, and how the light disrupts the seizure and stops the abnormal activities. Um, then, one more thing. So, because optogenetic tools cannot be used in human patients, uh, we use the pharmacological tool to target an ion channel in the thalamus called the SK channel. Um, and we found that that pharmacological treatment was also sufficient to treat this non-convulsive seizures. Therefore, we strongly believe that the thalamus plays an important role in this um, absence type seizures, um, even though these are not typical absences. And we think that the the thalamus could be, and the SK channels could be an interesting target for treating the Dravet syndrome. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Jean Paz. That was a, a wonderful presentation. What I'd like to do right now is invite David Parker to participate in the discussion. As I said in the very beginning, Jean Paz and I met with David and his wife, Hillary in October to talk about <clears throat> the work that John Paz was doing and their interest in Dravet syndrome. And what, um, what David, I'd like you to, to start um, by discussing is 
you know, what is your experience? What, what is the experience that you and Hillary have had parenting a child with, with Dravet? Could you share that? Yeah, hi. Thank you, uh, John, that was really great. Um, thanks for having us here, Chris. Um, Hillary, I think, is actually dealing with uh, our child right now, so <laughs> she might poke in and out in a second. Um, but, you know, sort of like, like John alluded to, you know, Dravet is a very challenging uh, condition for a child. It, it's an intractable epilepsy that is typically very difficult to treat, um, you know, with, with available pharmaceuticals. And it, one of the hardest parts about treating it is it comes with multiple seizure types, which is, I, I think, something that's relatively common with kids who have genetic epilepsy syndromes. Um, one of the things that, that is very challenging is, you know, sort of the, the standard treatment, as I understand it, for kids is, is what they call rational polytherapy, which is you use one drug to treat one type of seizure, another drug to treat another type of seizure. The challenge is all these drugs are quite strong. They all interact and they're kind of blunt tools. So you might be treating one seizure type and exacerbating another. And, um, you know, we came across Jean's work because there is a lot of research about convulsive seizures in Dravet and in other epilepsies, but a lot less about atypical absent seizures. And I think um, part of that is because they, sometimes they last half a second, one second. And I think traditionally in the treatment of really serious conditions like Dravet, there's sort of been an attitude of, of what's the big deal? You know, but we, um, you know, one of the neurologists in uh, our, our daughter's doctor's clinic sort of described it as, it's like flipping a light switch on and off. So for a developing learning brain, that's extremely challenging because they're trying to learn, they're trying to, to, to get their memory working, and then their brain just shuts off for a second. And it's like, you know, another neurologist described it as if you're reading and you're constantly losing your place on the page. And, you know, when you have a child who's three, four, five, and they're trying to learn, that's really challenging because it's challenging to teach any child that age, but a child who, you know, as many times as 100, 200 times a day is, is sort of losing their train of thought, it can be very debilitating developmentally. Um, but there's, there's not been nearly as much research on this seizure type and probably a lot of the drugs that kids with Dravet and kids with serious epilepsy get may actually make them worse. So that's, that's something that's been very challenging and was actually really um, enlightening to us when we discovered John's work and, and came up to, to see you guys and, and you know, the work that, that they're doing in the lab is, you know, what, what are the options and possibilities for target, really targeted therapies? Because that's something that these would, would really help these kids. And, you know, as Jean said, you know, a lot of the comorbidities of Dravet are sleep disturbance, um, you know, cognitive disabilities, learning disabilities, behavioral disabilities. And, you know, if you could kind of target the part of the brain that might be responsible for some of these, the, the quality of life for these kids would completely change. When, when you use the term, and, and we spent a lot of time together and talked in, in detail about Vivian's life, having trouble sleeping. Could you shed a little bit more light on that? I and mean, what, what, what has it been like for her, for you and Hillary? You know, it's, um, she's gone through different phases where she's been um, a pretty good sleeper and times where she's been not as good a sleeper. And one of the things that can be really hard to untangle is we actually just spoke to a, um, a sleep neurologist yesterday. We had a telemedicine appointment and spoke to them because it's hard to untangle what is the underlying syndrome and what are all of these drugs doing? Because a lot of anti-epileptics have sedative effects, but they can also have, you know, in some kids, the reverse effect and cause hyperactivity. That's sort of an issue with a lot of benzodiazepines, which are kind of first line treatments for Dravet and for serious epilepsies that you know, some kids react totally different, differently to different drugs. You know, some kids will take a drug and they'll, you know, fall asleep in the middle of school. Another kid, it will make them hyperactive. 
And you don't always know, it's very hard to unpack what is happening. So when she goes through periods where her sleep is not as good, we don't know, is this the medication? Is this the underlying condition? And because you have you know, all of this cocktail of a lot of drugs, it can be very hard to disentangle from a clinical perspective. Um, and obviously as anybody with, with epilepsy knows, whether it's a, a child with a genetic epilepsy or an adult with a well-controlled epilepsy, sleep deprivation is just about the worst thing for an epileptic brain, so. When you came in October, was there anything about the conversation that you had with John Paz that excited you, that you're really interested in learning more about the work she's doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one, um, you know, it was, it was really nice, you know, our experience um, in sort of the epilepsy world and community is, has been largely with clinicians and, you know, I have to say, John is, is, you know, had so much sort of empathy and understanding for what she was studying that really kind of touched us because, you know, we don't, we're not as tuned into the sort of the, the research world, you know, and you read research papers and I started to sort of, as, as I think a lot of parents of, of children with epilepsy do, you get very involved in researching and looking for anything that might improve your child's quality of life. And, you know, scientific research papers are by necessity sort of dispassionate and factual. And so to meet a person behind it who really understood the potential real world impact of the research was, was very meaningful to us. So that was, that was sort of on the, the highest level, really wonderful, but also reading about, um, you know, in, in the paper about a possible, um, the, the pharmaceutical or the pharmacological treatment that, that John discussed during her presentation. Um, that there might be something available that really can work on these seizures and is actually an existing FDA approved drug. Um, and that was something that's very exciting to us to think about is this, you know, what, and one of the things that we all talked about is what does it take to take that from the lab mm -hmm. to the clinical perspective and, you know, see if it works. Jean, do you want to talk a little bit more about repurposing the drug that you've been doing work on? Because we, we did, after meeting with David and, and Hillary, talk with some colleagues of ours who have experience doing that at Gladstone and, and learned a lot about the process that we need to go through and the economics. Would you like to share that? Yes, I learned uh, how difficult it is to work on repurposing a drug. Um, especially for a rare genetic disorder. Um, so just to summarize, uh, we found that targeting SK channels, the potassium channel, targeting those channels in the thalamus could stop those non-convulsive seizures in mice. And um, that finding excited me because there is an FDA approved drug that targets the same channel, and it's called TBZ, uh, and it has been used um, in other contexts, not in epilepsy. Um, and in adults. So it's a drug that has been out there for a while. It's FDA approved, um, but I'm still trying to understand how to make it useful to patients with epilepsy. And it hasn't been an easy path. I'm still working on that. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have an idea of uh, how long it might take to accomplish that goal and what it might cost? To accomplish the preclinical study, probably uh, between one and two years. Um, and uh, it's actually being very hard to fund something like this because it's an FDA approved drug. It's not a new molecule. Um, and no one will be you know, giving me billions of dollars <laughs> if this actually works for epilepsy. That has been the main challenge. Um, so for a preclinical study in mice, it would probably take about a year or two. And then if it works um, without side effects, uh, then we can discuss about perhaps um, using it in human patients. So I, I would invite anyone who's participating in the webinar right now to use the Q&A function so that we can have a interactive dialogue with, with David. I see Hillary has joined with Jean, Jean Paz. Um, Jean Paz, I have, question that we discussed the, the other day, which is more of an introductory question. Why, why did you decide to focus on epilepsy? What, what, what drove that decision? 
So um, I was studying years, I actually started uh, with medical school. I did medical school for a few years and um, I love neurophysiology and I discovered passion for research because I realized there are many things that uh, clinicians cannot do if, um, if there is not enough basic science to actually discover new targets. So I got involved um, in epilepsy research by joining the Sharpie lab, who had this amazing approach. He was able to record um, intracellular events, so electrical activities from single neurons in the brain, and understand what changes in the cells could actually be predicting seizures. Um, so what really um, excited me about you know understanding the seizures is that unlike many other disorders seizures start and spread and end right obviously epilepsy is much more complicated than just seizures as um, david mentioned there are many other um, problems right that people with epilepsy deal with such as sleep disruption cognitive dysfunction uh, etc and depression and the list would be very long but um, what really intrigued me about seizures is that they start, they spread, and end. So for a researcher, for a basic scientist, um, I thought, you know, maybe that's where we can make a difference, right? If we were able to detect these episodes before they start, if we could find which cells are sufficient to target to prevent the seizure from occurring, um, that would be my dream, right? And so that's the path I pursued starting 2002, so it has been more than 18 years now that um, I've been working on epilepsy. Uh, and uh, also I have a cousin who, you know, when he was a kid, when he was 10 years old, he was hit in the head by a neighbor with a bat and my cousin developed epilepsy, uh, very severe seizures. And um, that was, you know, many years later. So that also really motivated me to understand, um, to understand the brain better to be able to help patients to actually suffer from this devastating conditions. We, we have a number of questions which have begun to roll in, uh, one of which is <clears throat> around, um, around gene therapy. Um, what do you think of gene therapy for genetic epilepsies? That's a very exciting question too. Um, I actually discussed this with Jennifer Doudna a few weeks ago. Um, we were discussing how we could use the her you know, CRISPR approach um, to understand um, which genes may matter and how to target genes, how to, to treat the genes to prevent seizures or um, to reduce the seizures. And uh, because of the shutdown, we weren't able to continue the conversation, but I look forward to discussing with her in the future um, because CRISPR would be an amazing um, tool actually to use for genetic epilepsies. Jean, how common, you had mentioned that some um, forms of epilepsy are acquired, some are genetic. How common is it to develop epilepsy after a stroke or a brain injury? Another great question. So it really depends on the type of injury and the severity, the location. For example, patients with um, penetrating traumatic injuries, um, about 50% of patients, so one out of two, uh, are going to develop epilepsy. And this has been a major problem for soldiers who, you know, who have fought um, in the war. Um, so it's very frequent, right? 50% of chances to develop epilepsy, that's very high. Uh, for stroke uh, patients, it depends on many factors, the age. Uh, if you talk about neonatal stroke versus adult stroke, uh, the probability to develop epilepsy varies depending on the age, but about 10 to 20 percent of patients with stroke, adults, are likely to develop epilepsy over time. And sometimes it takes years. Some patients develop epilepsy after five to 10 years. Um, did I answer your question? You did. Uh, I have a, a, a question. Well, actually, it's a question posed by someone attending a webinar about the work that you were doing with the, the drug that you'd like to repurpose for Dravet associated seizures. What's the probability that it would be effective in treating other types of epilepsy? And um, could, you, could you spell the name of the drug and, and state its current approved use? Yes. Um, the 
like spelling the drug here. It's C, the abbreviation is C, CDZ, um, chlorazoxazone. Um, and I don't want to overstate, I don't know it's, if it's going to be helpful for many epilepsies, but um, it's definitely worth trying uh, to do preclinical studies um, to ask that exact question. Um, so SK channels, these channels are, that are targeted by the CDZ drug, which is FDA approved, they're actually really important for normal rhythmogenesis in the brain. And their roles have not really been explored in um, genetic epilepsies. Uh, or, you know, in the likelihood of having, let's say, a mutation in the gene for developing post-traumatic or post-stroke epilepsy. And so once I presented this um, result at a meeting and someone told me, you know, this is not interesting because we can't find in the, our database any reported genetic mutations in these channels. Therefore, it probably doesn't matter. However, I think it's a complicated question because if we don't know about a mutation, it doesn't mean that it does not exist, right? First of all. And second of all, um, it's possible that even if this gene, the SK gene, is not responsible for the seizures themselves. Uh, for example, in the case of the Gervais syndrome I was talking about, the initial mutation is, is in the sodium channel, is not, it's not in the potassium channel. But um, for us who are interested in translational approaches and making a difference for, from patients, I think it's still very exciting that targeting this channel can treat non-convulsive seizures because it's possible that targeting the sodium channel um, maybe could make things worse or maybe it's too late to target sodium channels when epilepsy has already developed. Um, again, I'm talking as a basic scientist, so... <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, I'm definitely very excited uh, if we had, we had the funding. I would definitely try this, uh, targeting this drug in different contexts, not just the Gervais syndrome, but also um, in, in rodent models with the lennox gastaut syndrome. Uh, by the way, t trauma and stroke are um, likely also to be involved in LGS, which is lennox gastaut syndrome. Um, so we would be very interested in actually looking at this channel uh, more in detail in a variety of epilepsies. And I don't have a very, you know, exact answer, but that's exactly the question I'm interested in pursuing. And I saw Hillary was there. Uh, maybe she can comment on her experience with, um, with Gervais as well. Oh, I think she left. Oh, here he is. Sorry about that. I'm watching two kids. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I just, you know, you know, I know you guys have talked, you know, so much about the science already behind this. And I just wanted to, you know, be here to just express, you know, the desperation that there really is out there um, for this research. When we look at, you know, as parents of a child with, you know, Dravet, when we look at what is available to us, this is an emergency. You know, um, this research, it's, we need it now. And it's, you know, I think that, you know, for us, you know, look, you know, meeting with Jean, for me, I was personally touched by seeing all of the mice that had Dravet um, and, you know, just feeling for them, feeling for their, for mother mice and, you know, the number of seizures and stuff that they have. And I just was, you know, you know, just the idea that somebody is out there trying to do something that can help our daughter and all of the sons and daughters out there um, because we need it um, so badly. And so I just, you know, yesterday, for example, I was playing with my daughter. She's having the greatest time outside running and playing. And then I look over for one second and she's face down in the grass, having a cluster of these atypical absence seizures and, you know, that she was in for two minutes. And then she's post And then for the, you know, we lose the next hours. And in that time, she's not learning anything. She's not even having a good time. She's not playing with her sister. All of those things that just the community is really desperate for this research. Hillary, you had mentioned the, the community. Do you have a, a network of parents that you've gotten to know through your experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's a really strong, you know, Dravet community because really nobody can kind of understand what this life is like unless you're living it. 
and it's a really amazing supportive community and everybody is really smart and educated on what's out there and we trade lots of information about drugs doctors you know what's going on and after i went up and visited the lab you know i posted in the group and it got just such an amazing reaction and you know people kept posting you know tears emojis of just the idea that there was a team of people you know at work somewhere that don't necessarily have this personally affecting their life that were out there trying to make a difference for us was just really really moved the community and Pulse, what did you learn from your meeting with with david and hillary and, and all of your interactions with them I, I know you've communicated with them a lot yes i was uh, you know really honored to meet with them and to hear from people who actually deal with this with the Gervais syndrome that non-convulsive seizures can be impactful because for the last 10 years I've heard different things from um, many people in my field uh, who think this is not a real problem that we should be funding um, more research on convulsive seizures and the non-convulsive seizures you cannot you know they're not life-threatening therefore um, they're you know less interesting to study so I always, you know, believe that this frequent non-convulsive seizures could have something to do with um, the, the cognition, the, the, you know, the burden, right, on everyday life. And talking to Hillary and David and, you know, them telling me that's exactly the problem with their child, that was, you know, I thought maybe I'm doing something right here. <laughs> and, yeah, because I haven't been very encouraged to pursue this path. So um, I think sometimes it's enough to meet a few people who believe that your work matters. <laughs> um, and that's just encouraging. That's just encouraging. And I think especially for my trainees who have been hearing the same kind of criticisms, it was life changing. Yeah. So they decided actually most of them to stay in the epilepsy field and to make a difference. And that's probably my future, my trainees. <laughs> Hillary. I met you once and I was very impressed with how committed and how passionate you and, and David were and also how upbeat. Uh, what is it that drives you both? You know, I think that we, you know, in talking about this like Dravet community, you know, we see parents of older children with Dravet and we see parents who have been just diagnosed, you know, sometimes at five months old because that's what they've gotten, you know, now genetic testing right away. And we see what was available to the people whose kids were in their 20s. And we see what is available to us now and what we're on the cusp of. And we know that we have the chance to change the direction of our daughter's life with the help of people like Jean. And so we are against a clock though, you know, at, at five years old, almost six years old, of getting these under control so that she has the best chance that she can possibly have. And so that's what drives us. You know, we, we need to do better for our daughter, for these kids, for everybody who's affected by these types of seizures, which are not, you know, obviously, as you guys have discussed, just from genetic epilepsy, they are extremely debilitating. Thank you. Um, Jean, I have one or two more technical scientific questions, and then we'll have time for closing remarks. In a clinical trial of a drug for Dravet syndrome, what might be the primary efficacy endpoint? For example, would it be a 50% reduction in absence seizures per day or something like that or something else? The, the answer is that I don't know exactly. <laughs> I don't know, but I know people who will know. Um, so for example, Maria Roberta Silio probably knows. Um, there are many experts in the field who are clinicians who would be able to answer this question much better than I would as a basic scientist. But it's a very important question, right? Uh, and it's probably not just about stopping or treating seizures, it's about avoiding side effects, right? That's what we want. We want no seizures or less seizures, but also no side effects. Because right. in some cases, the side effects are so bad that patients even decide not to take any anti epileptic medication. Well, when you mean the side effects are so bad, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Hillary would be, you know, a um, better uh, uh, person to talk about this, but um, 
it's, you know, dizziness, um, altered sleep, as David mentioned, sleep is a big problem, right? And uh, some drugs make you so drowsy that you know, some patients consider like, it's not life anymore, right? <laughs> Have you examined the role of post-stroke, traumatic brain injury, neuroimmune response in epileptogenosis in your animal models? Yeah, so that's exactly what uh, one of the main projects in the lab. Um, we are trying to understand how peripheral immune cells that infiltrate the brain, certain brain areas actually after injuries like stroke and trauma, uh, we're trying to understand how the immune cells interact with neural cells to lead to epilepsy over time. And um, that's something that I'm really excited about, you know, whether targeting the inflammation, actually the peripheral inflammation uh, and peripheral immune system could be an interesting approach for preventing epilepsy, which is a different problem for treating epilepsy. So prevention strategies are disease modifying strategies. And that's the dream, right? To be able to use a medication that would allow you to never develop epilepsy. And as far as I know, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, there are no such treatments out there yet. It, it, strokes are um, an increasingly greater problem for, for people in this country and in other countries. As a result, do you think that as baby boomers get older, the rates of epilepsy are going to increase? It's possible. It's a speculation, but probably because um, age is a, is a risk factor for stroke. And um, especially now with the COVID-19, we're hearing about even very young people having strokes because of the virus. So reasons we don't totally understand, but I have great colleagues who are working very hard on this at Gladstone and elsewhere. How has I, obviously, um, the you know, work environment is a lot different, but how has the shelter in place impacted your research at Gladstone? That's a good question too. Well, it stopped, right? We had to close the lab and stop our research and uh, it was very hard, but we won't complain, there is worse in life. Uh, but we had to stop our research on epilepsy and we're hoping to restart that um, in safe conditions while maintaining social distancing. Um, but it, yeah, we are on a pause, pause button, but I think many lab members have already um, a lot of data that they're analyzing from home. We're writing papers, um, manuscripts that we're going to submit for publication to share with the community um, some of the results we have. So we, we didn't lose time, um, but um, we are eager to go back to work and to continue our research. We, we talked, and I, I know we're um, uh, about at the end of the, of the time, we talked yesterday about what you'd like to accomplish in, in your career. Could, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, what's the goal? Well, what would make you satisfied and happy? Um, to find a cure for all FDFCs. <laughs> that would be my dream. Um, and that's too ambitious, but as a field, you know, I hope that by the time I retire or die, <laughs> I hope that our field, um, because it's a lot of teamwork, I hope our field will find uh, treatments for devastating conditions like the Dravet syndrome or like the Lennox Gastel syndrome. Um, these are very complicated problems to tackle. So I want my contribution I and mean, my dream to be. Um, accomplished before I retire, <laughs> before the end of my career. And I wanted to be, you know, making a difference for, for people with this condition. David and, yes. David and Hillary, is, uh, is there anything you want to say or about at the end of the, the program today? Just, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing and, you know, hopefully, you know, we can, we can find the support for this type of work because it's really important and you know, especially as, as John said, when there are people who are, you know, discouraging, um, that's sort of all the more reason to go forward because when you talk to families and it's, you know, by the way, it's not just Treve, you know, as, as John mentioned, you know, Lennox Gusteau, um, atypical abscess seizures are a huge, huge issue for them. And, you know, 
it, it's this is this is work that that is making a difference and can really continue to make a difference. And you know, we we we're we're hopeful that uh, the shelter in place will you know end in in due course, and you know everyone will be able to get back to work and and get back to this research, and you know that people will continue to support it because it is really crucial. Well, Jean and I want to thank you both very much. We enjoyed meeting you. We're looking forward to strengthening the relationship that we have with you. We really admire everything that you're doing for your daughter and for the epilepsy community. Jean, thank you very much for presenting and thank for the you. great work that you're doing in, in your lab. I want to thank everyone who's joined today's webinar for taking time out of your day to spend time with us. If you're interested in learning more about Gladstone's work and how you might support our efforts, please visit our website at www.gladstone.org. Take care, stay safe, and have a great day.